Good morning. Welcome to worship here at uh, damp and cool Blaine, Minnesota on this uh, first Sunday of April. Welcome to those who are watching and worshiping with us at home today. A couple of announcements. The mission of the month for April is Family Promise of Anoka County. Family Promise helps families experiencing housing insecurity to build a foundation of lasting independence here in Anoka County. Throughout the month of August, you can help by donating items needed to create two move-in baskets that will be given to families moving into stable housing. You can find the Sign Up Genius with the items listed by either using the QR code or uh, by going to CLC's uh, homepage and clicking on Mission of the Month. Contact the church office if you need some help with this. And then next Sunday, the director of Family Promise, uh, David Fry, will be with us. He will share the impact that Family Promise has on our community and how CLC can help support Family Promise's mission. This morning, you have a rare opportunity to wander into the marvelous land of technology with our own wizard chance. If you would like to see how the uh, service is, is recorded and uh, how all of that works, uh, we invite you to join him back there after the uh, service today, between the services, and he will uh, show you what goes into making worship happen here every Sunday, you'll probably be amazed. And then finally, uh, next uh, Monday, a week from Monday, April 15, is the Red Cross Blood Drive. If you'd like to make an appointment, uh, please visit redcrossblood.org or contact uh, Eileen Nichols. Remember that your donation can help save lives and is greatly appreciated. And now I invite uh, our treasurer, Tim Delmaney, uh, forward for a message. Good morning. It is damp and cool out there, isn't it? Well, today I want to share some updates in three different areas of finances at the church. I want to update you on our current church finances, update you on the Fellowship Hall Wing Remodel Project, and then lastly, I want to share some information on some recent capital purchases that we've had to make. As we've completed the first quarter of the year, I want to share where we're at financially. Through March, our actual gifts received, you can see it up here. Uh, the top line is our budgeted uh, gifts that were approved back with uh, the annual meeting in January. Um, the lower line is our, uh, our actual gifts that we've received in January, February, and March. Uh, so as you can see, uh, through March, our actual gifts received for ministry and outreach and building expenses are about $44,000 less than what was budgeted uh, and what was approved. Looking at our giving and our giving from both pledgers and non-pledgers, uh, giving is lagging compared to what we had budgeted in both of those areas. Your quarterly statements should have, if you receive it via email, uh, you should have received it yesterday. Um, if you receive it via paper, it'll be coming this week. Um, if you could please look at those and see where you're at compared to your your actual giving versus your planned giving, that would be greatly appreciated if you could do what you can to catch up if you have gotten behind. The quarterly statements do include Easter, and uh, the giving that I've shown up here does not at this point. Cash flow wise, we entered the year in, in really a less than optimal position uh, with lower cash flow at the very beginning of the year. And with lower giving in January and February, 
we needed to borrow $50,000 from the ERC funds that we have set aside for capital expenses. Last year at the same time, we had to borrow $30,000 from 60th anniversary appeal funds for cash flow purposes. And those funds have not yet been paid back. Our hope is to pay back some or all of the borrowed funds, both the 50,000 and the 30,000 this year, but that really depends upon giving. On a positive note, I do wanna thank you um, for the really strong Easter week, which w has helped us um, catch up a little bit and reduce that gap that was shown. Because of the timing of those gifts, um, they aren't included in, in our, uh, uh, the numbers that I've shown earlier. Because they came in on a Sunday and we deposited them on a Monday, which is in April, so they'll show up in our April financials and you can see that um, in the uh, newsletter that comes out in, uh, at the beginning of May. I'm getting my months mixed up here. In addition, uh, we've, we have had uh, some reduced expenses due to the mild winter. Um, we've been running under budget a little bit in utilities as well as in snow plowing expenses. And we'll continue to look for ways in which we can reduce our expenses throughout the year uh, in, in ways that do not impact our ministry. Uh, the final planned project for the 60th anniversary appeal is the Fellowship Hall uh, wing remodel. If you haven't noticed, we put some new lighting in there. Um, a lot of painting has been done back there by volunteers. Thank you so much for all your work. And a lot of decluttering has been done. We've ordered new carpet and that should be coming here shortly. It'll be installed this month. Uh, once that's completed, new cabinets and furnishings will be installed. And it's really exciting to see uh, these improvements move forward because it has been uh, some time. Remember, the funding for this is coming from the 60th Anniversary Appeal Funds. It's not coming from our Ministry and Outreach Building Funds, uh, which I spoke to earlier. Lastly, over the last few months, we've had to make a couple uh, capital purchases. Our large floor vacuum died. It, it, uh, it lived a long life, but you know, sooner or later, things have to be replaced. That uh, costs about $4,000 to replace. We also need to replace one of our boilers, and that was about $14,000. Both of these are being paid for by, through the uh, employee retention credit funds that we have set aside for capital funds, so that's great. Again, it does not impact our ministry and outreach and building budget. I really appreciate your time today and hopefully this helps you understand where we're at financially as a church. If you ever have any church finance questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or contact Sharon, our business administrator. And as always, thank you for your past and your future gifts to Christ Lutheran Church in uh, supporting our ministries. I invite you to stand as uh, you are able as we continue with the call to worship. Alleluia, Christ has risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. We have not seen the risen Christ, but we see him in the lives of those transformed by grace. We have not seen Jesus face to face but we have seen him in the faces of everyone whose love encourages us. We have not touched the wounds from the cross, but we have been called to bring healing to the scarred of the world. There is no darkness at all in the light of the risen Christ. We live in the brightness of God. Let us walk together as children of that light.
Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from 1 John chapters 1 and 2. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you that the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not, and do, not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship, fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to John, the twentieth chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen 
and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good friends of Jesus, grace, mercy, and peace be with you and among you. Amen. Every once in a while, there is something special that happens toward the end of the evening news. When all of the grisly reports of the casualties of war and bombs bursting in the air when reports of carjackings and school shootings and racial explosions erupting on the cruel and desperate streets are laid to rest for the time being, when weather forecasts threaten tornadoes and earthquakes, when fires and floods engulf the news, when the traumatic hearing of all of that has ceased, there comes a time in an occasional news report that is of a different tone and color. The camera focuses on a small child and then pans the room around her. It's a class play or a sporting event. And then the camera turns to a large box in the center of the room, and as the top pops open, it reveals a young man in a military uniform. Her daddy, home on furlough, maybe home for good. It's really him, my daddy, she wonders. Is he really here, safe and whole? His smile reassures her that he is, and that the love that she believed in all along is now here again, in the flesh, embracing her with open arms. She's filled with, with wonder and excitement. She's overcome by awe and incredulity. She disbelieves for joy. And so it is with the disciples and followers of Jesus on that first day of the week following Easter. The brutal assault on the life of the one who they pledged to follow to his death now becomes a very real possibility for each one of them. They were huddled together in a safe house, an obscure room not easily noticed. Maybe the room where they shared the Last Supper with Jesus only a couple of days ago. Jesus' mandate to love one another still ringing in their ears. But that could wait. Now they stood near the edge of the open window, peering through the flimsy curtain. They could hear the shouts from the streets, the clanging of the swords and armor of the soldiers. Are they next, they wondered? Sheep corralled for the slaughter? Surely this can't be the end. Would the love last that was promised by Jesus, their leader, their teacher, their last great hope? Words of, of Jesus' resurrection had filtered down to them. Some women and even a couple of the disciples in the room had apparently gone to the tomb and were met by a young man dressed in white. A messenger of some sort, an angel. And then in Luke's gospel, two men who had been walking the road to Emmaus now joined them in this room. They had seen Jesus. They reported they had even broken bread with him. He was as alive and real as could be. 
And they all at this report were nearly overcome by the fear and the shock and the awe that filled the room. Scripture says they disbelieved for joy. And then the cam camera pans to the doorway that was locked, by the way. And there, to their surprise, stood Jesus in their midst. No ghost that you could see the wallpaper through or a figment of their imagination. They shook their heads, stunned and filled with wonderment. The reports are true. Here is Jesus present in all of his human glory. The box of the tomb had popped open. The love that had drawn them together as his followers was now here with them in this room. It was palpable. They are embraced by his love once again. And he greets them with the blessing of shalom, a word that is used even to this day as a wish, a greeting for peace and, and wholeness. And then to prove the reality of his presence even more, he shows them his hands and his side and breathes his Holy Spirit on them, gives them a few instructions about forgiveness, and in the blink of an eye, he disappears. Now the Gospel of John makes a big deal out of the fact that Thomas was out of the room when Jesus appeared. And for starters, we don't know where Thomas is or where and why he was gone. Maybe he went out for a cup of coffee and sit on a park bench and watch the pigeons. Take some time to think about what's next. Maybe he was getting tired of the hand-wringing and all the talk about how it could have turned out differently if only... But then, too, you know, Thomas was a realist. He didn't believe in fairy tales, wasn't sure if this flesh and blood Jesus who he had come to know could now be walking about in a spiritual body of some sort, whatever that meant. He wasn't at the tomb, had only heard whispered reports. Was that enough to believe, to move forward on whatever forward would mean and where it would take them? Thomas is the spokesman for all of us who have heard about Jesus' resurrection but can't figure out what it means or where it is leading us. Can we tie our Futures, our choices, our life patterns to the report of a few eyewitnesses a couple of thousand years ago? If they disbelieved for joy, it is our struggle too to get to the hope and the joy of our lives through the confusion of disbelief. And we might take some encouragement from Thomas in that respect. For when he finally returned from his walk away, he was accosted by everyone babbling on about how Jesus had appeared to them in his absence. Yeah, you should have been there, they cried. It was him. He's real. He's no ghost, no idle rumor. He was here in the flesh. We even saw the wounds in his hands and his side. Ah, you missed out, Thomas. It was amazing. And Thomas, as we know, was skeptical, curious. We say doubting. But what he wanted for himself was nothing more and nothing less than what they themselves had seen. He wanted equal access to the blessed possibility of Jesus' resurrection. And he said so 
in no uncertain terms. So here it is. Eight days later, Jesus comes back again. And Thomas was there and got his wish. Jesus let him see him and hear him and touch him. And Thomas looked at Jesus' scars and felt his own scars open up. The one who had gone to the cross for him had now come back to embrace him. He understood Thomas. He received Thomas as he was with all of his doubt and reasoned resistance. It was a moment of grace and acceptance, the kind where the unlimited love of God meets the broken human soul. Christ was alive, and so was Thomas alive in his presence. He had no questions left and not enough energy left to ask them anyway. All he could say was, my Lord and my God. A few years ago, there was a movie called Regarding Henry, starring Harrison Ford and Annette Bening. It's about an ambitious, callous, narcissistic, but highly successful Manhattan lawyer. His obsession with his work <coughs> His, uh, his obsession with his work leaves him little time for his prim socialite wife and his troubled teenage daughter. And one night when he runs out to a convenience store to buy some cigarettes, while he's at the counter, a robbery breaks out and a bullet hits him in his right frontal lobe, while another one pierces his chest, causing all kinds of bleeding and a cardiac arrest, anatoxia and brain damage, retrograde amnesia. And slowly over time, some movement and speech return, but he's almost childlike, a, a shadow of the person that he used to be. And the scene that I want to borrow from the movie is the one where Henry is sitting on the edge of a bed with his daughter, Rachel. They're trying to, to reconnect, make some meaning out of the mess of their lives. And as they talk, they end up comparing scars. The one on his head from the shooting and the one on her ankle that she remembers getting when she fell off her bike. The saving grace is that their scars connect them. Their scars help to heal and allow them to move forward in their relationship. The scars shared are redemptive in the sense that allowing for healing to begin and for love to come creeping out for where it's been hidden all of these years. To understand someone else's scars is to understand them more completely. To begin to receive them with all of their arrogant, twisted, and battered ways. And this is what Henry and his daughter Rachel do for each other. And as they do so, they are able to find redemption in their fragile, broken lives. And here's that biblical word, shalom, redemption, again. See, we finally don't know much about Thomas, not as much as we even know about poor Henry. Thomas may not have been an intolerable, self-centered, callous wretch of a man, but Thomas probably had his own issues, his own scars, his own need of redemption. If he could just believe that Jesus was real, that the resurrection was real, if he could only touch the scars of his Savior, the scars of his own life might find some healing. 
like all of us here, I suspect. All of us carry scars. Some are obvious, like the one in the palm of my hand that I got working with my father painting a barn and fell carelessly into a pile of rocks while I was carrying a ladder. Sixty years later, it's still here. And lots of us have scars from accidents or operations. Well, some of us have scars that are less obvious. We wear them on our souls. They might have come from extreme harm done to us by someone, from insults or severe criticism, from seemingly unforgivable clashes and confrontations, from failures or rejections that we suffered at work or or at school or even at church, bullying, racist jeering, homophobic slashes. Some are self-inflicted, some are inflicted by others, some accidentally, some cruelly. Life is hard. It beats us up. It leaves scars. Beyond the pain and the memory, some of our scars make us feel continually broken and beaten down, unworthy of anyone's love, even the promised love of God. And we hide the hurt. We bury the experience. We pretend that we really are someone very different than how we feel inside. Maybe we even begin to lose hope that anyone could ever love us or accept us and our scarred up lives. Our physical, emotional, and spiritual scars remind us every time we see them or feel them how much we need to know resurrection. We long for the new life promised by Jesus, the risen one, and that it's meant for us in all of our doubt and confusion. We need to touch the hands and the side of Jesus and know that he is real so that we can be real and that he is with us now and that the love given for all the world is meant for us too. The cross is the scar of the love of God on the face of the world. In that cross and in his resurrection, Jesus has come among us to make true the promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. And Thomas heard that big time as he slipped his fingers into the open scar's of Jesus, my Lord and my God, he cried. He understood as he was understood. He was a new person, a resurrected person. It was unbelievable. And yet he did believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and still trust in God's promises. May you, with all your scars, by grace, be among them. Amen.
We continue now as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of the good news. Hear us now, Lord, as we join our voices together and call upon you in prayer. church cries out in the midst of a hurting world, O God, and you listen with compassion and love. As you drew near to the disciples following the resurrection, as they huddled together in the upper room, draw near to us this day and assure us of your presence. Breathe on us as well, your Holy Spirit, that our faith may be renewed and we give voice to the witness of your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your creation cries out, O God, and you listen to the wind that blows and the ground that awaits the spring. Nurture crops, trees, wildflowers, and all growing things. Guide farmers, gardeners, arborists, and others who tend the soil and nurture plants to life. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your world cries out, O God, and you listen to every anguished call. Guide police, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders to work for the well-being of the communities and dignity of every person, that all may live in peace, and that no one may need to live in fear. God of grace, Hear our prayer. Your children cry out in pain and struggle, O God, and you listen. Hear your people crying out for justice, for an end to racism and other oppression, and for a world where all are fed and safe. We pray for all who cry out in suffering or pain. We pray for our church family by name, David Voss, Nancy Olson, Roger Nelson, Dorla Christensen, Margie Gelker, Dwayne Peterson, and Betsy Solomonson. Bring them health and healing. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your congregations cry out with joyful hearts and open hands, O God, and you listen. Renew pastors, deacons, musicians, and other staff, administrators, and volunteers who planned and led Holy Week and Easter worship. With your Holy Spirit, guide the process of electing a new bishop for the Minneapolis Area Synod. We give thanks for the ministry of Bishop Anne and those who served faithfully on her staff. Open our hearts to discern where God calls each of us to serve. God of grace, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, 
we lift our prayers to you, almighty and eternal God, with the Spirit breathing in us through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who hears us as we sing. be with you all and also with you. Please share peace among each other as you are able. stand once again as you are able as we join together in the offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broken, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We share together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as you prepare to come to this great feast. Christ is the host. We are the guests. All are welcome and included without exception. Please come and be fed. to the paschal victim offer your thankful praises a lamb the sheep redeeming Christ who only is sinless reconciling sinners to the Father death and life have contended In that combat stupendous, the prince of life who died reigns immortal. Speak, Mary, declaring what you saw when wayfaring. The tomb of Christ who is living the glory of Jesus' resurrection. Bright angels attesting, the shroud and napkin resting. My Lord, my hope is arisen, to Galilee he goes before you. Christians to the table, the blood and body given, the risen Lord here is present, a feast to celebrate victory over death. Christ indeed from death is risen. Our new life obtaining, have mercy, Victor King, ever reigning. Amen. Mm-hmm. 
Please stand as you are able. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And the God of glory, Jesus Christ, above all names, names above all names, the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> 